Hello, it's great to have all of you back in the studio with us. And today in the series entitled Karma, Destiny and Choice, we are going to look at the impact of the most powerful soul in all of time called the Divine or the Supreme Soul, depending on which culture you come from. And today we will be looking at the impact of God specifically on the law of karma. Sister Denise, it's a pleasure to have you in the studio with us as always. Thank you. Let's start with um, something that is told to a lot of children uh, by well-intentioned parents, past and future. If you do not behave, God will punish you. As far as uh, being a good person, being good and bad is concerned, or to put it more colloquially, being naughty or nice is concerned, a lot of us were raised with the fear that uh, God is the punisher. Is God the punisher? This is in cultures where people want to um, manipulate children and they believe that children are fundamentally likely to be bad and they want to support their idea that they are good and that their duty is to make the children good. And this is passed down from generation to generation many, many generations. So people do that and say that without questioning it. In fact, the punishment for negative action and the reward for positive action is an automatic process. The problem is, if people say there is karma, negative karma produces negative result and positive karma pr produces the reward, then their question is, in that case, what is the use of God? So because of this reasoning, which is actually faulty reasoning, they make God the one who rewards and punishes. But in fact, God is independent of reward and punishment in terms of the laws of karma. If you do something against God, then your connection and contact with God will be broken and God will distance himself from you. And if you are really understanding the knowledge of karma and you are developing a powerful and deep relationship with God, then you will come close to God. So the distancing or uh, coming close between you and God is really the thing at issue. But if you do a negative karma, it's an automatic process. But the people who set up the religions, they didn't distinguish between those things. And so they came up with this idea that it's better to say that God is the reward giver and the punisher. What is the relationship between the law of karma and God himself or herself? The relationship is that God knows the laws of karma and human beings don't. Human beings need God in order to come to know what the laws of karma are about. Earlier you described uh, the law of karma as a machinery that is independent. I understood that to mean independent of human beings. Is the law of karma independent of God as well? Yes, it's completely independent. It's just that God knows it and people don't. So God doesn't have to s switch on the switch of karma. It happens by itself. By itself. God will be the detached observer and watch everybody's karma and watch the consequences. But God is the mother, father, teacher, guide, friend, companion of human souls. And so it is in the heart of God that human souls should understand this so that they perform correctly, so that they're close to him. Mm. Whoa. From centuries ago, when human beings encounter problems, suffering, anguish, trauma, it is so deep within us to cry out to the divine for help in alleviating our burdens. It is so deep. Why is this? 
And uh, surely he responds in some way? Almost definitely. And what is his response? When you call out to God for relief, God will give you relief, especially if you're sincere. Okay, so God has the power and the will to intervene. God is not going to stop the machinery of karma, but God is going to relieve your weakness, your inability to endure the suffering of karma. So that's a very powerful impact. So Sister Denise, you have been um, advocating for um, spirituality through your words and through the way you lead your life. So here's somebody who is new to spirituality and who's interested in um, walking the right path, as it were. And so this person is aware of their karmic baggage or has an inkling because it's invisible. Mm. And then you go to God. In a previous episode, you said uh, you don't ask God for anything. So you go to God with your karmic burdens and you do what then? How do you engage with the Supreme Soul so that um, you're protected, you're kept safe? How, how does that uh, occur where you engage with God with dignity, not as a beggar, please help me? I don't think you need to ask anything. The situation is obvious. You turn to God, you want God to be with you. Sometimes you may request help um, in that desperation. It's different from what I was saying before, where people tell God, do this, do that, do the other, tell him what to do. No, it's a different situation. You turn to God in your moment of great suffering, sorrow, difficulty, and God will respond. If you have developed a powerful relationship with God over a long period of time, you turn to God and you connect immediately. If you haven't, you turn to God, you don't know which way you're turning, you don't know who is God, you don't know what is God. Uh, it's a desperate thing. But I think if a person is really sincere and they turn to God, they definitely do experience relief. Mm. But this relief will be for a certain period of time because God doesn't interfere in the settlement of your karma. So God will give you some temporary relief. Like when you are ill and you have pain, you will get a shot of morphine, which will give you temporary relief. And then when it wears off, then you want another one, then you become an addict. A better way is if you develop a powerful relationship with God and you accumulate the power of the absorption of light and power from God, you accumulate from pure karma, you accumulate from knowledge, you have a stock. And then anyway you can turn to God, and maybe you turn to God all the time anyway, comes a period of suffering, you have the wherewithal to manage it, which is all provided to you by God anyway, because you have paid attention on this over a long period of time. Definitely you're going to get a much more solid relief because you have participated in your own process of getting relief. You've earned it. There's a difference between getting something you've earned and getting something as a, as a gift. What happens to your karmic load? when you are in God's presence? What happens to your karmic load when you spend a lot of time in remembrance of God is that it gets gradually eroded. And that's the point of meditation, is erosion of your karma. Um, also, you get powers to handle it as it comes up. And so your ability to manage it is really hugely impacted by your relationship with God. The presence of God is um, different. You want to experience the presence of God. You develop your relationship with God. In that experience of God being with you, 
your karmic load in comparison with that is small. So definitely it's diminished enormously. So what does one have to do in order to um, have God reduce one's karmic load? Uh, and I ask this in the context of um, most people having extremely busy lives. Whether you're a housewife or a businessman or a student, um, people have things to do, places to be, uh, not make-believe stuff, real stuff. So do you just, um, I don't know, give a certain amount of time to God on any given day? And um, uh, how does this unfold? It's a kind of companionship. You can do things in... Um the context of the presence of another human being. Uh, your connection with God is a relationship. So you can do your work, God is there. The amount of attention you pay to God and what you pay to your uh, work is going to move different percentages. But you have moments when you're free. You have moments when you make yourself free and you connect with God again and again and again. You're accumulating power. It's not that God is going to take away your karmic burden, but you are drawing the energy from God to yourself, and this erodes the karmic burden. Hmm. You're really doing it yourself. What you are saying is give God time? Yes. Okay. Pay attention to God. Get, have a place for God in your heart, in your life and um, make that quite a dominant place. You know, people may fail you. Circumstances, you don't know what's going to happen. The connection with God is independent of what happens. Someone is there or not there, or they're alive or dead or whatever. God is outside all of that, because God is on a different dimension. Mm -hmm. And you, the soul, have the capacity to go on that dimension and to be on this dimension, work with the two dimensions together, you have that capacity and you can become very skilled at it. Um, all of what you are saying makes a lot of sense logically. And it's uh, fabulous that God is willing to do this for us. But um, from a feeling perspective, um, what is God's motivation for wanting to do this um, for us? It's not like God is willing to do this for us or God wants to do this. It's not like that at all. The relationship between a soul and God is God is the mother, the father, the friend, the teacher. Because of that relationship, you do that. It's nothing like wanting to do it or being kind enough to do it. No, the relationship includes that. And if you become the child, the student, the companion, the, all these things with God, then you have a life with God while doing various things. You know, you're an actor, you're performing. Your relationship with God is on a different dimension. Your performance is on the material dimension, and you span both. I find it interesting what you said earlier, that um, at the end of the day, it's up to me. Going to God entails an individual taking responsibility for their karmic burden and going to God and saying, um, I am here, um, let's do this. You begin a relationship however you begin it. And you don't very often begin it because of a karmic burden. You begin it for many reasons. The karmic burden presents itself in the course of the relationship. And because the relationship is strong, you have the presence of God with you, the companionship of God, while you go through this. The phrase that comes to mind right now is something that I heard as a child, that God is love and love mm -hmm. is God. Um, how does that play out in terms of um, the law of karma? Well, God is not a vibration. God is an actual someone but who is so intangible that people have, you know, if they feel the love of God, they think that is love and love is God. But it's not really quite like that. 
it is said God is the ocean of love in the sense that the love that is contained within God is oceanic. You can say God is love, but you can't say love is God because there are many different kinds of love, none of which are God. It's very difficult for people to conceptualize God because God is intangible. God is pure spirit, not a human. Out of the range of most religious people, maybe within range for a mystic. How many mystics are there? It's quite rare. You know, different people relate to God in different intensities. And if you have love for God, God is very reciprocal. So you love God, God will love you, you will feel it. God loves everyone, no doubt, but not everybody feels it. And because of this reciprocity that is part of the nature of God, you do something against God, God will respond by distancing. It's not a punishment, but it means you don't feel anymore. So what you want is to be able to um, be close to God and feel God is with you. The concept of omnipresence uh, sits deep with many individuals. And uh, many feel that there's no need for me to uh, go actually to God because God is everywhere. How does that belief of omnipresence relate to your understanding of the Supreme Soul and the law of karma? This word omnipresence has to be thought about quite uh, clearly. What is everywhere? You could say, well, matter is everywhere in the material world. God can be experienced by someone from anywhere. But there may be something going on in the world which is not godly. And so you couldn't say that God is in that spot. People's argument for the omnipresence of God is that, well, you know, you can experience God's love anywhere or everywhere, but in the same way as daylight is experienced everywhere where the planet is facing the sun, but the sun doesn't have to be everywhere for it to be daylight. In a similar way, God is somewhere, and the impact of God can be experienced wherever anyone turns to God or um, orients themselves to God. But that doesn't imply that God actually is in every particle, etc. You know, the people who believe in omnipresence of God don't distinguish between matter and spirit. They don't distinguish between a soul and God. Everything is all one thing. They call it oneness or unity or whatever. Uh, but in fact, a soul can never become God. God can never become a human soul. A soul can never become matter. Matter can never become conscious, you know. So there are these three very distinct things. One is God, one is human souls, and there are other souls, animal, whatever. And then there is matter, which is without consciousness, but which is sensitive. And there's an interplay going on with all of these things. The amount of energy that's held in God is stable. It doesn't change. God is called immutable because of that. And because of that, when the energy of souls and matter is totally depleted, then come in contact with God and it restores the energy of souls and the energy of matter to its original condition because God is stable. If God is everywhere, then also God is depleting and then who can bring it back to its right level. So people don't really think about omnipresence of God in a logical, coherent way. And so if you want to make them understand, you have to sit down and go through all the points of the arguments, you know. Um, you mentioned that um, God is mother, God is father, friend. Um, the first two, those are rather primal relationships. So um, there is a need within the human soul to have a divine mother and divine father? 
the one thing that the human soul doesn't like is um, isolation. That is true. You are naturally one who likes to come in relationship because you get your sustenance from that. The thing is, if you're in relationship with God and you get your sustenance of all varieties from that one source, which is reliable, then you don't need to rely on unreliable sources from where you get both happiness and sorrow. From your relationship with God, you don't get sorrow, you get just happiness because God knows how to act in relationship with you. But a human being, maybe no, maybe don't know, mostly don't know, you get it wrong. So you get in karmic bondages. You want to have good karma with God. You want to be in karmic connection with God. So you have to do actions, words, thoughts mm -hmm. with God, about God, for God, etc. But in terms of um, human beings, your karma is all full of vices and desires and negativity and etc. So you get in bondage and you get suffering. I am able to have a, a conversation with another human being because myself and the other person are in a physical body. You mentioned in other episodes that the Supreme Soul is just a point of light. He doesn't have one of these whereas you and I have one of these. How do you uh, converse, connect, engage with the Supreme Soul, uh, the one who does not have a body? How do you uh, say, I am here, what within you do you use to get in touch with God? How does that happen? You have a mind which is connected with your soul and not your body. Um, people identify with their bodies and they say, I can communicate because I have a body. That means if you're speaking or telephoning or writing or whatever. But telepathy doesn't really require the body. It's just thought. And so you connect with God through the mind with thought. You can communicate with God. You can talk to God in your mind. You don't need a body for this. But you do need understanding. In order for God to communicate with people, he has to come to the level of people, to come to the earth and use the vehicle of a body to explain things and then take you to his level. Once you get the point, then you can operate on God's level. And this connection that you're referring to, it's not temporary, is it? It has to be an ongoing thing? Because it's independent of the body, it's independent of one life, another life, or whatever, whatever. Your relationship with God is a, an eternal thing. Your relationship on this earth is lots of temporary things. So it's different. But when you lose the power, the spiritual power, to know yourself and to know God, and then you're stuck in matter. Mm. And so you're transcending that. I must say it's um, heartwarming to know that the Supreme Soul is um, there for us humans with our karmic baggage. Yes. Yeah, it warms the heart. Um, intellectually, I get what you're saying, but from a feeling perspective, it's, it's quite sweet that he would do that, that he's willing to do that for us. The intellectual part of what you said makes total sense. I feel, though, that it's pretty sweet that the Supreme Soul is um, availing himself to us so that we can uh, lessen our karmic loads. That is sweet and heartwarming. Um, the love of God for us is knows no bounds and we just simply have to be open to it. I think not many people know that the love of God for the human soul knows no bounds. It's beautiful and a beautiful note on which to end today's talk. Uh, thank you, Sister Denise. That was uh, intellectually stimulating but also heartwarming, very heartwarming. Thank you.
So thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining us. A very powerful message from a senior yogi as to our relationship with God, how it impacts on our lives, and how specifically uh, the law of karma um, comes into play here in a sense that God can reduce your karmic burden. Thank you so much, Sister Denise, and thank you so much for joining us. Take care and goodbye.